Good morning. Greetings again in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, Pastor May Jesus. You have seen you coming to you from On the Wall, the ministries here in Alta Vista, Virginia. We're coming to you this morning at our Sunday school hour. We just thank God for you joining us this morning. Mm -hmm. Beautiful lesson, August the 18th, lesson 12, out of our King James Version of our standard commentary. Mm -hmm. uh, in it, a lesson other than Union Gospel Press. You should be able to follow along with us this morning. Uh, they follow the universal lesson plan and uh, also, uh, we are following that plan, but uh, you can follow along with us. If not, uh, our scripture this morning comes out of the uh, New Testament letter of Titus, uh, verse, uh, chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, uh, chapter 2, verses 11 through 15. Our lesson this morning is the rules of life. Uh, the rules of life this morning, again, uh, coming out of that uh, book of Titus, first chapter 1 through 3, second chapter 11 through 15. As we studied this morning, our unit theme is hope in the Lord. Our unit 3 is eternal hope. As we look at our lesson names this morning, we want to recall the blessed hope, then contrast godly and ungodly lives of Paul's day, then make a plan to eliminate some type of ungodly, uh, ungodly element in your own personal life. So uh, we hope to be able to look at that as we study this morning. We're going to read our lesson through, then our introduction, our lesson context, then we'll be uh, discussing our lesson line upon line uh, through our discussion this morning. So our text read Titus 1st chapter 1 through 3. It says, Paul, a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and according to uh, acknowledging of the truth, which is uh, after godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began, but had in due time manifested in his word through preaching, which is committed unto me according to the commandment of God our Savior. Verses, uh, chapter 2, verses 11 through 15. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared on all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope for the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. And these things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority, let no man despise thee. A uh, beautiful lesson this morning. Again, our topic, the rules for life. And again, as we study, we want to be able to look at that blessed hope and then contrast godly and ungodly lives and how to eliminate some of that out of our own personal life. Mm -hmm. So uh, let us bow. Father God, we do thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you for this opportunity to come. And, and as we come, Lord, we ask that you would just lower your dear servant down in the deep well of our salvation, touching my lips that I might boldly teach those things that you have shown unto me. Lord, we thank you and praise you in Christ Jesus' name. Let everyone say amen. amen. Uh, the rules for life. Uh, as we look at our introduction this morning, we talk about struggle for godliness. In a glance at the world news today, would that uh, make us seem like the churches are consistently plagued with ungodly behavior uh, from without and within? And recent scandals of greed and abuse and misuse of power remind us that the church is not immune from ungodly behavior. Yeah. But the people of God have always struggled uh, against ungodliness, and the mm -hmm. church has uh, sought ways to live uh, godly lives, even in an ungodly culture. Mm -hmm. The issue is uh, much an issue in the 21st century as it was in the first century church. Mm -hmm. But as we look at our lesson context today, Paul's letter uh, to Titus comes as a part of the New Testament called the Pastoral Epistles. And whereas Paul wrote these letters to specific groups of believers in particular locations, the pastoral epistles were written uh, to particular individuals, Timothy and Titus. In the letter of the church leader, Paul designated mine own son after uh, the common faith. And the letter to Titus involved events that had occurred in the conclusion of the book of Acts. But we have no exact knowledge of that sequence of events that happened. But by the time Paul wrote this letter to Titus, the apostle had been released from the imprisonment in the Roman jail and had found the occasion to be able to visit the island of Crete. 
And while visiting, Paul had evangelized and started churches. It is not, uh, however, that the gospel had already been preached and reached Crete many years earlier before Paul by some unnamed believers. You got to realize uh, during uh, the uh, 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 the time of of, of the uh, Pentecost, when when the church scattered, people went everywhere, and the church was being planted. The gospel spread not because people wanted to, because of fear, and they ran. And when they ran, they took the gospel with them. They mm -hmm. called it the uh, dispersal or the dispersal. And when they dispersed, they went out uh, spreading the gospel among them. So this letter uh, that, that that Titus involves again. Uh, certain uh, 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 unnamed uh, uh, events that was happening, whoever they were writing to, we are not sure. We're not sure of the events that happened, but we do know that it was a concern that Paul had enough to be able to write this letter to Titus to address it. Crete was a famous in antiquity as a source of culture and religion, and the Grecian people, however, was not highly esteemed in the Roman world. And Paul quotes a native Grecian prophet who describes the people as liars, evil beasts, mm -hmm. and slow bellies. And then while Paul does not name the source, but one possibility of the 6th century B.C. writer was Epimedides. And this statement has been called the Cretan paradox because if all Cretans are liars and 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 uh, and he was a Cretan that wrote it, then was he lying also when he wrote this statement? And Paul was accompanied on Crete by one of the most trusted associates and a Gentile believer named Titus. And the book of Acts does not mention Titus by name, but still he figures prominently in the letters of Paul. In 2 Corinthians, Titus is named in Greek nine times. And Paul wrote this letter to Titus about 65 A.D. and departing from this island while he was in prison. But Paul had left Titus behind to correct some of the chaotic situations that was there in the Cretan church. And most importantly, Titus needed to place an eldership in each of the congregations. Mm -hmm. And the church in Crete was troubled by people who had professed to know God, but lived demonstratedly different than the lives that God represented. Such people had deceived others and disrupted the community and brought needless controversy to the church. And today's a uh, lesson reveals how Paul's solution to this challenging situation and what the church in Crete was needed was sound doctrine and training in godliness. And this was a nitty gritty of helping believers to mature in their godly uh, as godly men and women. And Paul wanted Titus to grow this church by grounding them in the truth of the gospel encouraging lives of holiness within that congregation. So as we get into our study this morning, uh, our first study is the messenger. comes out of Titus 1st chapter, verses 1 through 3, servant and apostle. Our text says in verse 1, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledging of truth, which is after godliness. Uh, this letter was written, naming the author Paul here was written, and uh, Paul's other New Testament epistles reflect uh, this tendency also. In the first verses of this particular letter, Paul identified himself as the author. Mm -hmm. And then he says that he wrote this not of himself, but according to the faith of God's elect. This designation here uh, is saying that God has a gracious or generous choice of people to be his own. See, we are not chosen God. God has chosen us to be his own. So Paul wrote this letter uh, to uh, mature the knowledge of the truth to the congregation there uh, was at, uh, uh, at this church. And he wanted them to understand that, uh, that uh, to accept true salvation, they must repent and their lives must have uh, uh, the order that is uh, necessary for you to represent the lives of Christ. Amen. So God, he said, things must be done decently and in order. So you have to have your life uh, rightly ordered in order for it to be an uh, example as a Christian following Christ. Mm -hmm. So together, faith and knowledge produce what God and the behavior that, that follows God's statement that is revealed by Jesus Christ. 
and 10 to 15 uses of the New Testament uh, underlying this Greek word translation godliness is found in these pastoral epistles. And this usage reveals that Paul considered it crucial for the leaders in the church to develop godly lives. Mm -hmm. Some Christians were known for their what? Ungodly behavior. And therefore, it was appropriate for Paul to address this behavior from the start of the letter. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what I like about uh, 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 on Andy Griffin. Uh, oh, 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 oh. He said, you got to nip it what? In the bud. You got to nip it in the bud. Uh, nip it in the bud. So we got to be able to understand that if you don't address it early, it will become a habit. But once it becomes a habit, it's much harder for you to what? Get this thing out of your personal life, out of the church, out of your community, out of your family. Things must be addressed at a proper time rather than letting things settle for a long time. And then he tells us in part B of our study, commanded by God, verse 2. He says, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised from the world begin. The hope he implies is what wish, not wishful thinking, but I hope that doesn't rain tomorrow like that. But Paul says this was a hope of assurance, knowing that everything that God promised was going to come true in our life. So in this hope of eternal life, which God has promised us, he said God cannot lie. God said he would, and he will do what he said he would do. The promise is sure because it comes from a what? All perfect, all powerful God. Mm -hmm. He is trustworthy and he's faithful. And our text says what? He cannot lie. Mm -hmm. So it's just rooted in this eternal uh, promise that God has given to each of us that he gives us life and he desires us to be in a relationship with him, with the creation that he's given us. Even sin and death in into the world, God prepared a way for salvation to come through Jesus Christ. The Bible says while we were still yet sinners that Jesus Christ died for us. So that's what we have to understand. God has already prepared a way for us to get out of the situation that he understood that sin would get us into. Part uh, Verse 3 said, but he has in due time manifested his word through preaching which is committed unto me according to the commandment of God our Savior. And though God's promise existed before creation, only in due time mm -hmm. he revealed Christ as the fulfillment of that promise to redeem us from our sin. So God in due time, I don't know about you, but he came to me in what? Just in due time. So all of us, we find God just in due time to save us from this sinful world that we're in. And all of us have been called to be able to continue this word, to preach the gospel until the uttermost ends of the world. He gave the church the great commission in Matthew uh, 28, 19 and 20. And he said that go ye therefore in all the earth, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and I'll be with you always, even until the ends of the world. So God has given us a charge to what evangelize the world. So now in due time, we've been called to carry out what God started through Jesus Christ. We are to be followers of him. And in order to be followers of him, we have to do what he did. His charge was to, to send salvation to the world. And our duty is to what? To bring salvation to the world by offering and preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Then the message, which message do we preach? Uh, in the first half of Paul's letter, he addressed several needs that were faced in the church there in Crete. But then godly leadership in the church, a rebuke of those ungodly behavior that the church was having, and then give them some sound doctrine that will be able to lead them to a more better godly uh, life in their behavior. And it says grace appeared in verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared to all men. Jesus Christ came into the world. He revealed himself. He said he did not hide himself. He made himself known to the world. So this grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared to all men. He said that he died that all men might be saved. It's not God's uh, uh, desire that men be lost. 
It's his desire that all men be saved. So God sent his darling son, Jesus Christ, into the world. And then he has been revealed to all people. Now it's up to you and I to choose to accept him or reject him. Uh, verse 12a says, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world. See, God's grace has two ways of working. God's grace worked by giving us uh, the penalty of sin being uh, taken away from us, but it also takes away the what? The power of sin. So God has a two way of, of working this thing. In order for us to live a, a, a godly life, we have to get rid of those ungodly and worldly lusts that we have in our lives. So we have to come to God to surrender ourselves unto him because he is only the way that we can get rid of those things out of our lives. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So no one comes to the Father but by me. But teaching us that we need to deny the worldly lust, but he gave us that power through Jesus Christ. Redemption is through him, but also how to live a godly life also comes through that same power. The same power that God has to forgive sin, God has that power for us uh, to be able to rid us of that sinly uh, nature that is inside of us. So he has the power to forgive sin, but he also has the power to be able to cleanse us from all sin and all unrighteousness. So we need to live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world. So he's given us the power to do it. We don't have that power because we reject the power. If we accept the power, we accept uh, what uh, Jesus has, and he has the power to, to give us uh, the ability to live soberly, to live righteously, and to live godly lives. So God's grace instructs us as believers to replace that ungodly behavior with righteous behavior. Live soberly uh, suggests that we should be able to rid ourselves of those passions and those desires that pulls us away from Christ. So in order for us to do that, we have to put on Christ. You can't get rid of without putting some in. Uh, it's going to be half full or half empty. But if it's empty, in order for you to be filled, you need to what? Put something in. Amen. In order for to push out what's in there. So once you fill a cup over and you run it over, what was in the cup eventually rise to the top and run out. So we get to have the fullness of God working in our lives to rid us of those ungodly and those unrighteous behaviors that many of us have in our personal life. Amen. Then where is this hope coming from? Promise hope. Looking at verse 13, he said, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of God, a, a great God of our Savior, Jesus Christ. See, many unbelievers dread that the future may bring uh, in their lives, but believers, however, we have a blessed hope of Christ uh, that he uh, will return to receive his church unto himself. Even though we experience some trials and some sufferings in this world, that Christ promised to bring us redemption and renewal to this world that we live in. This hope is filled with a glorious appearing of Christ and uh, here on earth and his return will restore uh, this earth back to the glory that it was in creation. He said that we will experience glorious renewal and a resurrected life. So God revealed his grace through what? His darling son, Jesus Christ. And then through him, we can have this new relationship, this rebirth, this renewed relationship with God our Father through his son, Jesus Christ. Verse 14 said, how did he do this? He gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous for good works. So he said he did this so that he could redeem us, but not only redeem us, I said not only save us, but he made us to purify us, mm -hmm. to make us into the peculiar people that God desires to be. God did not make us to stay the same. 
you were born a baby, but you didn't stay the same. You grew up into a, a, a toddler, then into an adolescent, then into a, 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 a young adult, and then into a mature adult. If you are at the age that you are today and you're still acting uh, in your behavior at the level of a child, that means that you have not matured. So God is looking for some mature people, not still at the same level. Paul told the church that I would give you meat, but because of your immaturity, I have to give you milk. So God has things available to us, but at our immature, ungodly, unrighteous state, we cannot handle those things. But once we receive God and, and, and allow uh, that, that, that work to start in us to mature, and then we become the peculiar people that God uh, desires to be. And then we'll be zealous to do the work that he's called us to do. He said, yes. zealous unto good works. You don't mind doing good things because you have the Christ working on the inside of you that has transformed that old person into the new likeness of Christ that is inside of each one of us. Yes. Then verse 15 said, these things speak and exhort Rebuke with all authority, let no man despise thee. Mm. Paul concludes this section of his letter by uh, imploring Titus his action to encourage the people to continue to lead holy lives. First and foremost, Titus addressed the problems in Crete. God had set Paul, uh, Paul apart to be able to preach the gospel. And then from this position of authority, from your position of mother, from your position as parent, from your position as sister, from your position as brother, pastor, deacon, deaconess, your opportunity and your uh, desire to address those problems that you are under. See, you're always over or under something. God has put you in a place of authority, but you got to be just like Paul. You got to address this with authority as a mother. Dress it with authority as a husband. Dress it with authority as a pastor, deacon, or deaconess in the church. See, here you got to speak things with authority so that it can strengthen the faith of those other believers in the church. Mm -hmm. Why did God make you strong? So that you could help those that were weak. Why did God make you weak? So that you could reveal the strength of those that are in your congregation mm -hmm. that are strong enough. Amen. God wants to reveal uh, what you are able to do uh, with the gift that he's blessed you with. We are blessed with different levels of gifts. Some gifts are blessed to be able to help others, and then some are blessed to, to be the, uh, the the victims that you need to help. God, he said the poor will be with you, what, always. So God has the poor with us to be able to go out and help. So we have to, from that position of authority, we got to be able to do what God has called us to do. He said Titus could exhort and rebuke because what? The authority that Paul had given him. And this is specific chain of command. See, I don't speak with the authority of major. I speak with the authority of the Bible. You got to speak with authority that has authority. See, you don't have any authority. But I come to you. Remember what uh, David said? He said you un circumcised Philistine, I'm coming to you, not in David, but I'm coming to you in the God of Israel. I'm coming to you in the name of the Lord. So mm -hmm. our, uh, uh, our, uh, our authority is not of our own. We are coming to you with the authority of the church, the authority of God that he has given to the church, and we're coming to this, uh, with this authority, we can be able to manage and do what the work that God has called us to do. And he said, don't let nobody despise you because of that. Because you're operating not because of what you have uh, been uh, uh, um, gifted to do. You're doing what you have been called to do. See, sometimes operating in a gift is that you can operate outside of that gift of doing the wrong thing. See, the gift don't necessarily, you're going to operate that gift to do the right thing. But a call that God has on your life, you have to walk into that gift and that calling that God has for your life. So our conclusion is the gift of grace. That's the gift that he's given us. When we feel burdened by our failures and our struggles, we can take hope because 
the good news that the grace of God has arrived for each one of us. It has come through Jesus Christ, and Christ given of himself has redeemed us and also purified us. Therefore, we hope uh, have hope in eternal life and a hope anchored in God's saving gift. And God's grace is the gift of humanity. We So our prayer today uh, is that God, our Savior, we thank you for the gift of grace that has appeared to your Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for your gift of salvation and the hope that we have because of it. By the power of your Spirit, help us to live godly and purify our lives. In the name of Jesus, let everyone say amen. So our thought to remember this morning is we have a blessed hope in Jesus Christ. God bless you. We'll be back in a few with our morning worship show. Join us then. God bless you.